Everett Millet. Now, John Everett Millet was born in 1829. He was born in Southampton, although he spent his formative years in uh, Jersey. And uh, he was a precocious uh, child. He, he was a very, very brilliant draftsman almost from the age of six. And he could draw likenesses um, of uh, the world around him and particularly portraits uh, from about the age of seven. And so much so, uh, his parents realised, rather like the parents of Mozart, that they had a child who was an extreme prodigy and needed uh, to be encouraged um, with his art. And in fact, he went up to London with his parents, who were of reasonable means. He always came from a good, good, uh, solid middle class background. Um, so unlike other of the pre-Raphaelites, he was, was reasonably well off, although he did struggle at first. But um, Millet uh, came to London with his parents. They settled in, in Gower Street. M Millet uh, was admitted to the Royal Academy of Art at the age of 12, which is that he was the youngest ever student and he absolutely excelled uh, as a young man. And by the time he was 14 and 15, he was celebrated by the other academicians. And although at that stage, he wasn't his full uh, stature of over six foot tall, they used to take him on their shoulders and uh, play games with him. And he, would, he, was, he was absolutely, um, uh, you know, looked on as, as a very uh, fine, fine artist uh, in the making. Um, now, I've just included a couple of little examples from his very early years. Here is, um, here is a painting uh, approximately about the age of, of uh, 17 years old, um, a self-portrait, which is in the Walker Art Gallery in Liverpool, just a small little painting. Um, by this stage, he had painted the wonderful The Seizing of the Inca of Peru, which was uh, his first exhibit, main exhibited work at the Royal Academy at the age of 16. Um, and on the right is an example of uh, some of his early drawing. And this is um, of the Lempierre family, which uh, were based from Jersey, but they were also in London, military family. And um, Millet would often draw them. He was invited to parties and social gatherings where he could make very quick um, freehand drawings of um, the social set and it was it, and that's a good example that you can see on the screen on the right of him as a young man drawing he was extremely good at capturing a likeness straight away uh, he never seemed to have the difficulties that so many others had with learning things like perspective or or composition he was a, he was a, 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 an absolute natural and a very very fluent draftsman from the beginning um, but of course the story really begins uh, for our, as regards Millet, Millet as a portraitist, um, with the um, formation of the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood, which I covered a little bit, when, obviously, with Holman Hunt, so I won't go over the same ground again. But uh, we're, we're, our concern tonight is not necessarily the subject paintings, it is the portraits. And this portrait on the left is very, very interesting. This is Mrs. James Wyatt, and uh, she um, was the wife of, of James Wyatt, who was the uh, picture dealer and print seller and framer in High Street in Oxford. And uh, Millet painted a, a lovely portrait of uh, um, James Wyatt with his granddaughter. That's a, a, a well-known painting uh, with a beautiful view into the garden and sur Wyatt surrounded by um, paintings from his collection, small, small scale paintings. But in the background of this one, and also in style, this is pretty radical. This was painted in 1850. And this is really a manifesto painting, because if you look at the painting, you can see that Millet is making a comment on Raf um, Leonardo and Raphael. And we have uh, the Raphael Madonna, Madonna um, in the corner above um, Mrs. Wyatt's head. Um, Millet is painting, though, in a quasi um, manner, rather like a, Van, a Roger van der Weyden or a van Eyck. He's, he's actually isolating the figures. Uh, they're almost like cutouts. Um, and he is particularly concerned with um, actually portraying it uh, as as w it would have been a 15th century painting in many ways. So it is a sort of faux naivety about it, but it's very, very studied and very deliberate. And he, he, sh he shows this because he's, he's well able 
he had proved himself uh, two or three years previously that he could paint very uh, competent ac academic paintings. So here he is adopting this, this um, side on view of uh, Mrs. Wyatt. And this painting is in the, in the Tate Gallery. Um, he also includes a, a little, a, a little colouring book at the side there and the child's doll. And you'll notice that dolls feature a lot in Millet's portraiture of children. Um, so it, 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 it is a lovely little painting. And um, uh, as with all the pre-Raphaelite paintings from uh, this period, it is wonderfully finished, tiny little brush strokes, um, stippled, uh, rather like the Thomas Kuhn portrait in Oxford, similar period. It's um, beautifully painted with tiny little brush strokes. Um, and uh, we have here Millet uh, really proclaiming that uh, this is an entirely, this is a new, this is a new style and, he, and, he's, and he's let rip on this one. He painted two other watercolours of the children of the Wyatt family. And the Wyatts were, were, were a good introduction to Oxford and of course his meeting of uh, Thomas Coombe as well. So we move on, oh, sorry, just going to go back here. Now for the Pre-Raphaelites, um, what, what was it that they were looking in, 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 uh, in their subjects and in portraits? Well, the Pre-Raphaelites were known for not using professional models, but actually using their friends and people that they met. And uh, this was to get um, something really authentic into their painting, rather like going back to nature and, and copying from the trees and the plants and the birds that they saw around them. They also were very concerned about actually uh, looking in particular at people's faces and, and their heads. And at this time there was a quasi um, uh, pseudoscience of phrenology, which um, had become very, very popular in, in, in early Victorian England. And if you notice some of the early pre-Raphaelite paintings, very often the um, phrenologists were, were concerned with uh, understanding character from the bumps of the skull and the forehead and the temples. And that's a little diagram from the Franz Joseph Gold's um, uh, book on, on phrenology. Um, obviously it's been debunked, but it was something that um, some of the pre-Raphaelites uh, toyed with and played with and you can see that in some of their early paintings and certainly the, the foreheads are very prominent in so many particularly a painting like Christ in the house of his parents and this one uh, this detail I've taken from Ferdinand Lourdes by Ariel which is in fact a portrait of the, his pre-Raphaelite brother Frederick George Stevens and also here we have a pencil drawing of Dante Gabriel Rossetti, which was drawn for Claudio and Isabella, which was his first major pre-Raphaelite painting. So there is this um, science going on. It was one thing that um, Ruskin also cite, cited this, um, this in, in influence, that how pre-Raphaelites were in, interested in the particular and, and the com commonplace rather than heroic. So they were, that is why they, they didn't um, normally engage professional models. And that, that is how they had a circle of friends and particularly among the women, very often they were, were women that they met, um, and, well, most notably people like Annie Miller and Lizzie Siddle um, were useful models for them because they weren't, weren't professional models. And therefore it gave something of a naturalness to their early um, paintings. Uh, here we is, is a very good example is the portrait here of Wilkie Collins who was a, a friend of the group, of course the, the, the author. Um, um, notice here um, I've just put next to it a, a Hans Memling painting which um, Hunt uh, saw when, when he went um, uh, to uh, Flanders and um, yes the pre-Raphaelites very much liked um, the portraits of Hans Memling and uh, Jan van Eyck, of course, the Arnolfini marriage was one painting that uh, is often cited when we talk about pre raphaelitism It is the Northern Renaissance paintings in, in many ways which had the greatest influence upon the uh, young Millet rather than the Italian painters. Um, here we have um, Wilkie Collins, um, also those who know the Thomas Coombe portrait, uh, notice at this stage that often like Charles Alston Collins, um, uh, a shield was put up in, on the, in, into the corner of the portrait, which is a device that uh, gives it a sort of archaic 
sort of sense to it and uh, was common in uh, certain portraiture. Um, his hands are uh, propped together and that's a, a wonderful bit of actual wonderful bit of drawing you can see there but also it sort of mimics the hands in prayer in a more religious portrait. Um, this painting is in the National Portrait Gallery, very small and actually quite dark for what we might consider a pre-Raphaelite work, but, uh, but a lovely, lovely little portrait and an early portrait, pure portrait example by Millet. Millet excelled at um, his use of the pencil. Um, he, obviously many years of drawing from the cast with the stump at the Royal Academy uh, had given him great skills in understanding tonal balances, the fall of light and darkness, and most of all, of course, as a portraitist, his deep insight into, into character, particularly the eyes. If you look at the eyes in all of Millet's portraits right from the beginning to the end, there is a living human being behind these eyes. They're not dead eyes, they are very, very soulful and very, very particular. And this is a lovely drawing here of Frederick George Stevens made shortly before Hunt went to the Holy Land. And uh, he, uh, Frederick George Stevens, a painter himself, but of much less skill than Millet or Hunt. Um, but a, a very, um, uh, as a young man, he, he, he had quite a physical uh, presence and uh, he appears in a number of the pre-Raphaelite paintings. Uh, there is a, a wonderful portrait of William Holman Hunt by Millet, uh, beautifully rendered in pencil. And then I just put one from the subject of pictures, um, a study for a Huguenot, Millet's um, first very popular painting, um, and that is um, the head of the woman in that, who I think was Miss Ryan, and she was actually a paid model. Well, we come to the famous uh, John Ruskin portrait of 1853-54. I mean, many of you will know the story surrounding this, of, around that fateful summer of 1853 in Brigger Turk. The painting was commissioned uh, by John Ruskin's father. Um, Ruskin himself and his wife Effie accompanied uh, William Millet, Millet's brother, and um, and John Everett Millet to their little cottage in Brig Brigo Turk, which is uh, about nine miles outside of Calendar in Perthshire. And I've actually been to this waterfall. Um, uh, it's in the heart, of, it's, it's just a lovely place in, in the heart of the Trossachs, beautiful countryside of Perthshire. Ruskin had picked it because of this wonderful outcrop of Nice rock, which uh, had shown him uh, it, it it supported many of his theories about, about um, uh, nature and uh, he loved the action of the water upon the rock and exposing the rock to different uh, shades. Reskin also made a beautiful drawing of the rock in the background of this picture. But as we know, this, this trip uh, brought about circumstances that were to change both Ruskin's life and Millet's life forever because uh, the non-consummated marriage between Effie and Ruskin uh, really began to fall apart as Millet painted on this rock. He was painting the background. Effie would sit with him as she uh, was working at her sewing. And slowly but surely, John Everett Millet and Effie Ruskin fell in love. But um, being a Victorian England, this was fraught with great, um, great difficulty, great moral difficulty and danger. Uh, remember Ruskin was the great champion of the pre-Raphaelites and yet Ruskin in his, was very detached in a sense about it and almost one could say did not disapprove of the burgeoning friendship between Millet and F.E. Ruskin. Anyway uh, you can read much about that in, in Mary Lutchin's book and many other and the model wife book um, uh, about this love affair which was so scandalized uh, Victorian England. Um, Ruskin himself, I've just taken a little detail of his head, which was painted a year later on the stairs of the house at Gower Street. So really, uh, on leaving Brigger Turk, there was a big white patch on the canvas where John Ruskin would, would stood. Um, and they all made, and there's a whole series of letters that you can follow, uh, following this, the course of this portrait. It nearly didn't, nearly wasn't finished. It was finished. Uh, as indeed the marriage became finished at the same time. This is a lovely little painting by Millet of um, Effie. It's known as the Foxglove Portrait and it is at Whit Whitwick Manor in Warwickshire. 
and here is Effie sewing away on on a garment. She 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 was a great seamstress, and she made many of the costumes for Millet's uh, later subject paintings as well. So she was a great great support to him in his life. But at this stage, this is this is the infatuation, the falling in love, and in a sense um, painting her as the object of his desire. And in fact, um, he painted a lovely little painting that's in Delaware. Of, of the waterfall, which was a, a trial study for the Ruskin waterfall with um, Effie once again sitting sewing by the bank. And he also made a wonderful series of caricatures and cartoons while he was at Brigger Turk. And this is Millet having his hair cut by Effie. Uh, I think we all know the, the whole thing about having haircuts at home at the moment. And uh, well, there's, there's Millet having a, a haircut at home. Uh, well, not at home, but at the little cottage at Brigger Turk. And so here we have, here we have them together. Following um, really the scandal and in fact uh, this period of 1854 when the two were apart, finally marrying in 1855 on the annulment of Ruskin's marriage through non-consummation, um, uh, Millet married Effie. Um, but during this period, M Millet uh, retreated to Scotland where he stayed at Bowerswell in, uh, in Perth, the, fam the Grey family home, and uh, they also took a little lodge further up the hill from Bowerswell, uh, which is Anat Lodge, and this is where Millet painted, um, shall we say, a number of smaller female heads and small studies, very often about women in contemplation, uh, small, small paintings, these weren't large academy type paintings, these were the uh, what Holman Hunt would often uh, refer to as pot boilers, but in Millet's case, as in Hunt's case, they were beautiful studies, and particularly of women. So I've picked three here, uh, one from 1854, Highland Lassie, wonderful painting. I mean, look at the way he's painted, uh, not only the, the, the soulful eyes of the, of the uh, peasant girl looking directly at us, but also the way he's painted her clothing. Uh, every line on the, um, the twill has been painted beautifully. Wandering Thoughts has a sort of semi ang type pose with the drop letter in the hand. Very often at this period, there were paintings of um, opening a letter or a message uh, in a flower. These, these are the sort of things, Millet was waiting for messages, for letters. This is the way Victorians communicated. I think I've spoken about this before with the uh, idea of um, flowers being at the heart of a lot of what uh, the Victorians did and uh, the way they communicated with one another. And here is an, a portrait of Sophie Gray, um, who was the main girl in his famous painting, Autumn Leaves, but this is painted two years after that. Um, a beautiful younger sister to Effie, um, and she, this portrait is a, is a fabulous portrait, painted on paper, primed paper, um, but a very, very strong painting and uh, bringing about a new wave almost in Millet's work, a new form of aestheticism where he's very concerned with pictures which are just about beauty, not particularly related to any subject other than beauty. And in this case, feminine beauty and uh, adolescent beauty. Millet um, began to make a break with the earlier form of pre raphaelitism and not Whilst Autumn Leaves was praised by Ruskin, remember Ruskin continued to take a great interest in Millet, even though it, it, his marriage had broken up. And, uh, but uh, this painting he declared a disaster. And I've taken a detail from it. This is Sir Isambras at the Ford, A Dream of the Past. Again, this is a, a painting which concerns death, it concerns uh, a twilight world. But what I want to show you here is the superb way Millet can capture contrast within paintings. Here we have the young child looking up at the old knight. Her clothes are soft and, and gentle. Her eyes are full of um, wonder. And the eyes and a twinkle in the knight's eyes are beautifully painted, a beautiful study of age. And this is something Millet is absolutely brilliant at getting and uh, if you just look at this as a, as a it isn't a portrait but it but these are wonderful portraits in a, in a sense and Millet very often does contrast things like armor against uh, a soft skin um, cloth against metal all these things continue throughout his art um, throughout his life um, we notice we, we can see that time and time again in his subject pictures 
but also the beautiful way he uses colour. And there is a slight loosening of the pre-Raphaelite technique here, so that whilst one couldn't exactly say it's painterly, he certainly is using oil paint in a very, very um, beautiful way, and it's, it's not quite in the tightness of the earlier pre-Raphaelite work, 1857. So we move on and um, we come into the 1860s and this is when Millet actually begins to paint some commission portraits. Um, and here's a, here's a charming little portrait of Henry Manners, the Marquis of Granby. Must remember that his grand, grandfather was painted by, um, or great-grandfather I think, was painted by Reynolds. The, the, grand, uh, the Marquis of Granby. Uh, but look, this both, I've chosen both these and John Wycliffe Taylor to show you that there is an aspect of Millet's portraiture which I want you to notice, that his children are very seldom ever smiling or merry. Very often they are very, very um, sad in, in, in their countenance, maybe staring, uh, there's a sense of loss about them as well. Um, rather like the faces that you get in, in a Burne Jones painting, that there is this wistfulness, this melancholy about them. And uh, certainly you can see that in Millet. These are two beautiful little portraits. They're only a matter of about 15 inches high, but um, painted in a slightly looser technique than the pre-Raphaelite technique. By the 1860s, Millet had made considerable strides uh, away from pre-Raphaelitism. He could still paint um, paintings like the Ransom he painted in an almost pre-Raphaelite technique, but he had become a little bit more, a bit faster and a bit more rapid in his brush strokes. Um, but the heads are beautifully studied and beautifully done, and he was excellent at painting children. One often feels that his paintings of children, he was reflecting on the childhood he never had, because his childhood was an extraordinary childhood. It was, it was, he was all his time in front of casts or drawing academic subjects or in, in, um, classes about um, composition and, and how, to, how to mix oil paint. He wasn't like, a, like a, another 10-year-old, uh, 12-year-old. He, he, he had been at school since his very early, early years as an artist. And so there is something about that in his work that certainly looks, um, looks towards uh, that that he has lost. And we can see that in the faces of these two um, children. Millet delighted in painting his own family and pretty soon got off the mark with um, Effie and uh, they, they had a large family. And this is a wonderful painting. This is called The Wolf's Den. It's just come back onto the market and um, I believe it's been bought quite recently, 1863. So I can now show it to you. Um, and it is of his daughter Effie, his son Everett, Mary Millet and George Millet. And they're all playing beneath the piano as children do. But notice they're not smiling. They're, they're in contemplation. I'd also point out too that very often on these paintings of the 1860s you get um, flowers strewn on the floor, you get um, dolls, you get little hints at narrative but nothing too specific. Uh, it's a game, it's a beautiful piece of colour and a bit of, a bit of asceticism. Um, Whistler had exhibited at the piano in um, 1859, which had, uh, Millet um, had met Whistler through the Etching Club and uh, he was certainly very well aware of this new approach to painting, the, the American painter uh, James McNeil Whistler. And uh, Whistler too uses the piano obviously in this one, but one feels that there is this interplay between Millet and Whistler going on and certainly we can see that more definitely in some of the other portraits I'll show you. Um, but uh, a beautiful painting, this, this one, The Wolf's Den, um, very well, I'd love to actually see it for real, but this is taken from the showroom, um, but uh, you've got a good idea of that rich uh, colour. Millet delighted in the early 1860s of using this very, very rich red, um, pillar box red uh, within his painting, and he does it to great effect. This is um, a, a print of Millet painting in his studio at Cromwell Pace, uh, near the um, near the Science Museum, just over the road from the Natural History Museum, Cromwell Place. In fact, uh, just a little aside, uh, many years later, Francis Bacon was to use it at his studio. I don't think he kept it quite as tidy as Millet did. Um, notice Millet's studio, as he's painting here, my second sermon with the little girl falling asleep in the chair. Um, Millet draped his walls with um, tapestries or Flemish tapestries. 
or um, uh, and, and these appear in the backgrounds of lots of his portraits. Particularly if you look in the background of this one on the right of Lily Noble, you can see part of the tapestry that is depicted in, in the um, uh, Vincent Brooks print. Um, Millet uh, would work standing up. Um, he had, a, as you can see behind him, he had a mirror. This is very important as an artist to have a mirror if you're doing portraiture. You have to re-examine the work in the mirror to see that there's no imbalances. The eye often has a, has a bias towards one side. And so as an artist, you have to look at things in the mirror to check that there are no imbalances. And Millet also preferred always to work standing up, uh, particularly after the Pre-Raphaelite years, where he would pace backwards and forwards he would place the model on a dais, which as you can see in the studio, which would be so the head height would correspond with his own eye level. And this is uh, something that uh, also Thomas Gainsborough used in his portraits. Uh, but Millet does this and continues this to when he lived at Palace Gate later in the 18, in 1870s. But um, here he is at his first studio, or from when he had moved from Gower Street to Cromwell Place. And here he painted many of his most successful paintings of the 1860s. This painting here, Leisure Hours, which is of the Pender sisters, is, um, I think, one of his, his, his best um, portraits. Uh, it is of two girls, um, their lives almost as um, trapped as those goldfish in the bowl. And uh, Whilst the, the goldfish bowl is a beautiful piece of painting, I'm just going to show it to you, but it also suggests something else too. Um, what about that screen in the background? Looks slightly familiar. Um, it looks very similar to the background in um, uh, uh, his first pre-Raphaelite work, doesn't it? And um, possibly uh, the goldfish bowl looks rather like the pot of basil, maybe. Anyway, I'll leave that with you. But what a gorgeous painting for colour. You've got these rich russet reds, the browns, the golds, and, and you've got the two girls who are sitting in contemplation, holding, holding some lilies, uh, primroses, and uh, a beautiful, beautiful piece of painting. I've seen this in, I, I took this photograph when I was in Detroit, Institute of Arts, um, a stunning piece of painting. Um, uh, Pender was, a, like many, uh, an up and coming, um, uh, in the cloth trade. Um, so many of the, he was satisfying many of the uh, clients that were coming ahead, not just people like the Marquis of Granby, but, but, but the up and coming industrial, um, industrialists of the period who wanted paintings of their families. And uh, this becomes increasingly important uh, to Millet. And particularly in this, the 1860s, he really was forging, quite apart from a, a wonderful career as an illustrator, he was also becoming sought after for his portraits. There's a little example uh, of the goldfish bowl. I hope you can see that if you've got a bigger screen, it's well worth seeing, but uh, an amazing study in, in light as well. Uh, we looked at Holman Hunt the other week. Well, Millet also is fascinated by the fall of light. He'd shown that in his pre-Raphaelite works. But now in a slightly looser style, not I wouldn't call loose, but um, certainly he's very, very adventurous in the way he paints that and uh, beautifully done. On the right, we have uh, a Japanese fan. And we must remember that uh, Japanese fans appear in the work of none other than James McNeil Whistler. Now that, that fan there is from a Millet painting of um, Miss Davidson. But um, here we have Millet in 1865 with his subject picture, Esther. And there we have from 1865, Whistler's uh, The Princess from the Land of Porcelain. Uh, Millet and Whistler were continually um, in a sort of visual conversation with one another. And Millet was beginning to use daring color combinations. Um, pictures, although it's of the biblical uh, Queen Esther, it is also very much about color and, uh, and art for art's sake in one sense, although Millet of course, stuck with a colour. He didn't call these things symphonies or, or arrangements like Whistler did, but he was very much obviously as uh, taken by the beauty of colour and uh, shape and feminine beauty as, as, as much as Whistler was. Um, Esther is a wonderful painting, by the way. So it's now in a private collection in the USA, but um, a superb piece of painting. It's a, back, it's a jacket which has been turned inside out. 
Um, but uh, certainly on some of Millet's better portraits, and particularly of, of women, uh, he paints uh, fabric, he paints pattern, is, a, is an enormously important part of his portraiture. And uh, he does it in, in a superb way that um, is, is uh, really true to the material, but also is, is visually very interesting. So our eye follows, um, follows the lines of, of the composition and uh, a beautiful um, way that he places colour. And this is through years of years of painting. Uh, by now, of course, Millet had been painting uh, professionally for, for over 20 years. So he was, um, although he was only a man in his, in his 30s, early 30s, he, he had been painting, you know, for 20 years, quite uh, 20, 25 years, actually. Here we are. That's the painting of Miss Davidson, as you can see with the Japanese fan. This one I actually photographed at uh, Farringford, which is uh, Tennis, Tennyson's home. It's now gone back into private ownership. Um, and there you can see uh, Millet deliberately echoing Whistler, Whistler's famous Symphony in White of 1864, the porcelain uh, on the uh, mantelpiece. Um, also, Miss Davidson too, uh, Millet is perhaps making a comment back on his painting of 10 years previously, The Blind Girl, the, the Miss Davidson holds a little accordion, toy accordion in her hand, and it rather reminds us that Millet is constantly referring to other works of art in his own works of art. If you notice the little cup on the floor of Miss Davidson as well, he unusually paints his monogram on the cup, on a piece of, on a piece of porcelain, a porcelain cup. So in, in a sense, he's uh, again echoing Whistler. Sometimes the same pieces of furniture appear in the backgrounds of Millet's paintings and the same pieces of carpet. And those who are experts on Millet, uh, we, we come to recognise the furniture of the family home and the tapestries he's using and the, and the side tables. These become very familiar within his paintings and yet he approaches them new every time. Well, there's Symphony and Might number one, uh, a shocking painting by Millet, uh, by, by Whistler, which was, um, of course, uh, alluding to the loss of innocence of, of this young woman. But Millet um, echoes that in his amazing painting of 1868 of Nina Lehmann. Um, uh, the Lehman Bank, of course, was the one which uh, uh, was the one we heard so much about ten years ago, which went which went bust. Um, uh, this is this is um, the great great um, uh, grand. Uh, I suppose back in uh, to the great grand grandparents of, of the Lehman brothers as today. But um, uh, this, this is Nina Lehman. Um, I've included, included two portraits of her because he painted her once again as Lady Campbell in 1884. Um, but I want you to notice that her as a child here, um, look how brilliantly Millet captures the, the, the glaze on the ceramic um, urn on which she sits. And, and the turtle doves on the ground, uh, the flower within her hand, and once again those deep soulful eyes that Millet gets. The gaze is absolutely arresting. It's almost like uh, Sophie in Sophie Grey in uh, Autumn Leaves. It, it suggests um, a loss uh, that childhood is a very fleeting thing and beauty is fading. And this is a big part of Millet's work. We know it's echoed in his subject works like Apple Blossom Spring. Um, it's emphasised in The Boyhood of Raleigh. It's emphasised in so many of Millet's works that it's about, it's about a world of childhood is a fleeting time and we should capture it um, and that that phase will pass very, very quickly. And that is part of Millet's um, brilliance that he can capture childhood in that way. And yet he can also capture uh, feminine beauty in, in the way he did in 1884, where his style are considerably broadened from the style of the 1860s into a fluid painterly style that um, was very exciting. But once again, there's a Whistler reference in the 1884 painting. Notice the porcelain pot on uh, Lady Campbell's um, uh, shelf there. She sits there with her gloves, her fan. Um, it's all there again, and the wonderful yellow background. Were that Millet had painted more backgrounds in colour like that, um, I think his reputation, particularly for male portraiture, might have increased had he been a little bit more adventurous in the colours he'd used for his backgrounds. But anyway, 
Um, I, I present to you Nina, Nina Lehman's portrait. I think that is, is one of his greatest child portraits. Oh, of course, we've got this one too, of his daughters, Mary, Effie and Carrie, the painting sisters, um, which uh, came, which we were able to see at the 2007 exhibition. Uh, again, a wonderful piece of painting, um, beautiful freehand painting. By now, by the 1868, uh, with the painting Rosalind and Celia in the Forest of Arden, Millet's brushwork had loosened up even more. And so he was really um, looking to artists like Gainsborough and Reynolds, particularly Joshua Reynolds, which is surprising considering his earlier um, opinions on, on Reynolds paintings. And um, he, uh, as you can see, it's loose, it's painterly, it's, um, but it's, it's, it's full of body, unlike Whistler, it isn't, it isn't a soft, a soft uh, sort of touch. It is, it's full of vigour, full of body, full of energy. Millet's painting has always got this activity. He would rub anything out. If it looked over laboured, he would scrape, scrape it out with his palette knife. So uh, we have the background. Now, if you bear in mind the background, with it's very similar to the background of Hearts, Hearts of Trumps, which, which came a little bit later, um, came uh, four years later, but it's exactly the same background. And again, three women, but this is three girls. But his daughters, um, were models throughout his life and he painted some wonderful portraits of all of his daughters and his family who he was immensely proud of and um, were he wrote to them um, almost daily sometimes when he was when he was up in Scotland he wrote to Mary and his letters to his daughters are, are, are wonderful things and uh, and, very, and that's how we learn so much about Millet's thoughts and his life uh, through his letters to his daughters and his son and of course the loss of his son George uh, prematurely in 1879 was, 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 was a tremendous blow to, uh, to Millet. Well, a painting that um, really um, sealed Millet's uh, de departure from the work of the early 1860s and really uh, set his sail for the future was his, um, acad um, his work, uh, his diploma piece for the Royal Academy, which is A Souvenir of Velasquez. And you must remember that Velasco was becoming much more, um, much more important to Victorian uh, to, to art by the um, late 1860s. Um, many artists were looking uh, to the Spaniards' great uh, fluid and fluent brushwork, um, to uh, the, the brilliant tonal analysis, um, uh, the wonderful use of paint and uh, a la prima not making drawings beforehand but actually painting the thing directly on the canvas uh, in a number of sittings and this is the way Millet worked he generally uh, did not paint sketches for his uh, portraits he didn't paint he didn't make sanguine studies or um, charcoal studies for his paintings um, in in general uh, only occasionally did he make small pencil sketches uh, in later years. He wasn't at all like Holman Hunt who continued to make uh, fastidious studies of every object. Millet wasn't like that at all. Um, I, and I've included a piece of um, a detail that I took of the brushwork when the painting was on exhibition last year in Southampton. So a very close up and if you look at that you can see that his painterly approach is now very vigorous, very very bold and uh, a beautiful use of colour. Um, so that's Souvenir of Flasco, based on one of the Infanta portraits. Uh, it's in, I can't determine which one it was, but I put one in the corner that it may be based upon. Again, another play between him and, um, uh, between Whistler, Mrs. Hugh, who's an extremely old woman. Um, but here, Millet, a year later, um, sort of does a, a take on the Whistler, but he shows how to paint the, the elderly lady, but with a full volume. So in a way, it's not flattened out like Whistler's, not turned into any kind of design, but it's, it's just looking at old age and uh, very, very carefully studied and beautifully painted again, and a wonderful study of age. Millet was always really good with old age. Um, if he, right back from Lorenzo and Isabella, right the way through Christ in the House of His Parents, he could paint uh, the way that um, age was written on the face in, in a, an absolutely superb way. And there's a lovely parrot in that one as well. There's um, Effie Millet, um, now in her 40s, and there, there she sits in a chair. That is a, a, a very personal portrait, it's remained in, 
um, that's in Perth Art Gallery. Um, Mi uh, Effie Millet has on her, her lap the Cornhill magazine and she is pointing to a little circle on it which is actually um, for um, the season uh, of, of harvest and summer and fecundity. So she's actually saying, you know, she's been very productive as a, as a, as a, my, as a, as a mother. And initially there was going to be her son, John Grielmule, sitting on her lap, but he was painted out and she just has the Cornhill magazine on her lap. And here's a lovely painting too. It's Evelyn Tennant, which is owned by the Tate Gallery. And in 40 years, I've never actually seen it on the wall of Tate Britain. I wish they would put it up there. Uh, but I think that's a wonderful portrait. Um, just like some of his wonderful uh, baskets you've got, you've got there, you get that in Sweet Emma Moorland and in, the new, and in the New Laid Eggs. Mille is great at painting something that one, if you are an artist, you know how difficult painting a wicker basket is. Mille is almost showing off by doing something like that. Also the Victorian obsession with ferns, uh, which appear in things like The Bride of Lammermuir, Mrs. Leopold Rice, and a number of other of his paintings he puts ferns in because there was a sort of cult for ferns at that particular time. And here is Hearts, Hearts are Trumps, the great um, declaration of um, his uh, now mimicking Reynolds and uh, pairing with Reynolds. Um, we've got a, uh, the, the screen uh, in the background with the pagoda, the, the love of oriental things that was uh, sweeping through uh, uh, British art at that time. Um, notice the table here, if you would. Uh, now the table on which the Armstrong daughters are playing cards is also the same table that Mille used um, four years before for the gambler's wife. One of his subject pictures, which is a sort of uh, ironic. And in a way, um, the Armstrong sisters of, of the great uh, well-known Lord Armstrong, who collected many Mille paintings, Armstrong himself went bankrupt four years later and uh, so this was had to be sold and uh, but of, but actually fortunately it did actually because of he, he had betrayed the feminine beauty so the, the beauty of his daughters so well that they were they were the talk of the season when they when they came out in in 1872 and uh, very often these are rather like uh, I, I don't know if they still do them these photographs of uh, young heiresses in country life but it's with that sort of thing it was uh, um, uh, something to sort of almost show the marriageable quality of, of your daughters and none more so than the Armstrong sisters. A beautiful, beautiful painting. It was possibly based on a painting by James Archer from the Royal Scottish Academy two years previously, also called Hearts of Trumps, but that was a far inferior painting to Millet's version. And Millet, of course, was is, is based on uh, Reynolds, the Ladies' Waldegrave from the National Gallery in Scotland. Um, Mille was by um, the 1870s fully uh, mixing with the great and the good of Victorian England and here we have the Duke of Westminster. This is a, a full-length portrait that both he and um, uh, his wife, uh, you can see this is the old Eton Hall which unfortunately uh, was uh, destroyed in the, in the 1960s because of uh, dry rot and uh, and uh, now it's a new building in Cheshire. But uh, the, the Westminsters um, employed Millet to paint all, all his daughters and uh, many of Millet's portraits can be found there if you could get access. And that's a very uh, fine portrait in his uh, riding, with his riding crop and uh, suit, full length, full height. Uh, Millet adopting the sort of grand manner of portraiture by now. Um, and a, and a, you know, a, good, a, a, a very, very, We've come an awful long way, haven't we, from the pre-Raphaelites by the time you see this. One of the best paintings, I think, of uh, his mid-career is Twins, Kate and Grace Hoare. Um, I've included this little joke that the Fitzwilliam Museum have put up on their website in the last three days, uh, showing uh, social distancing and face masks. Um, you can buy this postcard from the Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge um, of uh, the sisters now wearing masks as indeed you can buy one of the bridesmaid. But what I want to say about this painting is that uh, here as a portraitist, this is Millet at, at his best because he is able to show identical twins but with different character. And this is something that is supremely difficult as an artist to do. And yet he's, made, he's done this in a way really like no other. Quite honestly, this is a, an astounding piece of painting 
he has, he has communicated the difference in character by uh, that deep look into their eyes, um, by deep study of their, their face, and able to, um, with their dashing costumes as well, to just say an awful lot about each of these women. And um, I think this is a stunning portrait. Fortunately, it's come into the collection of the Fitzwilliam. If you are in Britain, I would recommend, and when the art gallery is open again, do see this one, because it certainly puts pay to the idea that Millet's art had sort of declined it to change, but it, had, it certainly had not declined in observation or indeed in beauty and skill of uh, a skillful handling of paint. Um, I'm sure any artist would have been proud to paint something like this. And also by the 1870s, he was becoming uh, very much sought over after by uh, the um, statesmen of the period. Um, and uh, Michael, I know in many of the other lectures, has shown pictures of Disraeli and Gladstone and uh, Rosebery. So I'm not going to show you those tonight. But this is one that we don't see so often, but this is uh, one I know is a, is a, a hero of, um, of, of Michael's, the Earl of Shaftesbury, 1877. Um, and I think I think a wonderful portrait of him. Um, uh, it, it it just shows Millet's insight into the into these great into these great uh, figures of Victorian England. And in, in in a sense, it's like a roll call of Victorian England. Millet painted them all, apart from, of course, sadly, he did, was never called to paint Queen Victoria because of the previous scandal. One imagines, but um, it, that 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 is another subject. Uh, Ronald Sutherland Gower, uh, this is of the Royal Shakespeare Company. I think that is one of his uh, best Kit Kat portraits, a, a, a three, uh, three quarter length. Um, a nice angle on that one. Um, and a lot, and a, lot of, um, a lot of empathy in that one, I think, too. Um, and that can be seen in Stratford. Two stunning female portraits, Kate Perugini, the uh, daughter of Charles Dickens. Uh, remember, she was featured before in the Black Brunswickers, um, but here she is painted, and this is painted in 1880, so this is when John Singer Sargent was starting out on his career, and uh, he certainly gives Sargent a run for his manner, or something to think about here. Look at that brushwork at the back of this, the dress there. It's, it's uh, beautifully painted, but very, very rapidly painted, um, almost like a Manet in some respects. Um, and that beautiful turn and that beautiful line that uh, in the hands of a lesser artist would look incompetent, but in Millet's hands, the way he can get the flesh through the muslin uh, and suggest the turn of the head, a, a sophisticated piece of portrait. And again, the painting of Louise Jopling, which has often been uh, come to the attention in the National Portrait Gallery now. Uh, this painting also employing this really rapid brush strokes, uh, but also the, the wonderful sense of pattern and design that we get on on the dress and the flowers and Jopling a strong woman he didn't paint women you know in a weak way he, he painted them uh, as strong characters they were they weren't they were no shrinking violets they were um, and as Louise Jopling as a painter in her own right and he admired that and uh, he certainly uh, did not look down on his on on women in any way at all he was uh, he gave great uh, deal of attention to uh, uh, women women's portraits gave them a great sense of dignity and uh, and power within their portraits another one that's come on the market quite recently i quite like this one of uh, mrs sebastian schlesinger um, that came on the market quite uh, about a couple of years ago and it's a, it's a, a wonderful piece of painting um, then the other painting on the right is a Jersey Lily, and when Lily Langtry um, came on the scene, um, uh, she was immediately uh, um, the talk of the town. Really, uh, well, we know she became the mistress of um, the Prince of Wales, but um, quite apart from that, she also became the model in many uh, well-known Victorian paintings. So GF Watts is um, um, the parson. Uh, the, Parsons' daughter and Effie Deans. Millet painted her as Effie Deans in, uh, from the Walter Scott uh, novel and um, uh, uh, Heart of Melodian. And um, here we have a Jersey Lily, which is Lily Langtree. And this was Millet's stunning portrait of uh, Lily Langtree, uh, which was the talk of the Royal Academy that year. But it wasn't just women. He painted uh, the great uh, Cardinal Newman. Uh, in 1881 and Millet here was given 
full reign really to look to his great, uh, for his great love of Velasquez and um, was able to paint Newman almost like a pope um, in, 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 uh, in his cardinal robes and uh, what better management of, of, the, of uh, reds have you, have you seen in Victorian art than this? This is far superior to uh, Watts's portrait of Cardinal Manning. Um, this was painted for the Duke of Norfolk and part of his collection. It's now in the National Portrait Gallery. Um, and uh, has been reproduced many times and engraved many times, of course, because um, uh, the coming uh, with, with the re emancipation of the, of the Catholics again within, within Victorian society and Newman's powerful voice uh, within Victorian England, it was, it, the print of this was very, very popular and indeed, uh, as was the painting, and there is actually a copy of this as well, um, uh, which was done. Um, possibly painted uh, in Luke thinking of the Pamphili portrait uh, in the, from the Pamphili Palace, uh, although Millet didn't go to the Pamphili, but he would have known he would have known um, engravings of it of Pope Innocent the Tenth. Uh, here we are. This is uh, one I took of Millet's palette from the eighteen eighties. Um, long handled brushes. Um, as I say, he would work standing up. He would hold this in his right hand, and he would. Um, place his colours, uh, his, his colours in a circle, mix in the centre and that's the section of brushes and he apparently would spend a great deal of energy walking backwards and forwards, um, always boldly painting, wiping his brush after each brush stroke. Um, we're quite pleased to have this unfinished portrait of him, of his son, um, gives you an idea of how he actually painted his portraits because he, he didn't paint them like Hunt with a little outline and and very, very carefully in that way. He painted with broad brush strokes, laying in colours, and gradually the painting developed um, in about three or four sittings. He was very often able to complete a painting in something like eight or nine hours um, each sitting. In fact, sittings for the Gladstone portraits took about two hours, so each sitting. Um, but he did remind a lot of his uh, sitters or shall we say standards in some places, that they had to keep position. But he would engage them in conversation throughout his portraits um, and particularly good at uh, talking to children as well. Uh, there's a, uh, um, by now he has moved to Palace Gate in uh, Kensington uh, and uh, just um, just opposite, uh, 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 if you know where, um, if you go in, uh, just before you come out of High Street, Kensington, you come, before you get to the, the Royal Albert Hall on the right, uh, is Palace Gate, and uh, that's his studio. It's the Zambian High Commission now, but you can still go. You can still see that room if you you get permission. Uh, it hasn't got the Millet's paintings in it anymore, unfortunately. And there's some of his portraits um, all um, stood on their easels, um, and uh, I can identify those, but I shan't right now. Um, but what I can include on the right is something quite interesting. Millet's uh, friendship with uh, the photographer Rupert Potter, father of Beatrice Potter. And uh, Millet employed uh, Rupert Potter to take photographs in progress of his paintings. And he would ask Rupert Potter to overexpose them so they, they're quite light. And then he would work on them in stages and he, Millet would then make corrections in Indian ink over the top of the photographs to maybe reposition the uh, sitter for the next sitting. So he did, whilst it isn't like a, a, a maybe a modern artist who might use a photograph and square it up and paint it. I mean, they use photographs as uh, guides, rather like sketches in a sense. Um, um, he did paint a couple of paintings from photographs. Um, I'm not going to show one here, but he did paint one posthumous portrait, which he painted from a photograph. So he was obviously throughout his life, he had taken an interest in photography, but, um, it, it was it was um it was an inter it was a it was a play between the two he had his son also was a keen photographer Geoffroy Millet was a uh, a keen photographer and he had helped Millet establish some of the backgrounds for his landscapes using photographs uh, this is another example there's a there's a photograph by um Potter of John Bright the politician the um radical politician and there is John Bright's portrait. Now you can see a great similarity between the, photo, the pose. The, actually, if you are a painter, you will notice that the eye level has been altered on the painting to the photograph, so it isn't exactly the same. Millet has met 
the, the point of the eyes, uh, the eye level is lower. So in fact, the dais has been, has been moved and Bright's position is slightly different. But that's a nice painting. That's in the House of Commons, if you're ever invited, you can see that painting there. He continued to paint his family, uh, Beatrice Caird, the son of Sophie Caird, who was Sophie Gray from the Autumn Leaves painting. She was troubled in adult life by uh, fits of melancholy, mental illness, probably, uh, and uh, took her own life, and sadly, not long after this painting. And Beatrice herself, uh, the little girl, didn't live uh, to adulthood. So there's a lot of sadness there as well, but wonderful paintings, and they're, they're paintings done with great affection. Um, and there's Millet in his later in his fifties uh, now. There he is at Rupert Potter's house in Perthshire with a prized salmon at his feet. This is how Millet. It has possibly not in the twentieth century, twenty first century, done his reputation that much good that he was as fond as his rod and gun as um, as he was his paintbrush and palette. But there we are. That, that's Millet for you. He lived the life of a gentleman. He mi mingled happily with the people he painted. Indeed, he was looked up to by many of the people who came to sit for him. And that perhaps added to the, the quality of his portraits because he struck a friendship with uh, Gladstone. He was able to talk quite um, on level terms with some of the people that other artists like Frank Hull and Haircomer could only wish for. He was uh, treated uh, because he was by now he became a baronet and he was um, uh, top of the pack of, in society himself. Now Millet's work wouldn't really have um, got out there, there was no internet in the Victorian era of course, um, the way to do it was through engravings and here is Thomas Alden Barlow, um, there were many engravers of, William, of Millet's work but certainly Barlow was one of the best engravers and here he is with the uh, Newman portrait and the portrait of Henry Irving and if you notice back on the wall the Gladstone portrait and it was Barlow who engraved many of Millet's um, uh, portraits and uh, did it very very successfully and of course a great deal of money was made from the sale of engravings after these great men and uh, they were superbly done in Mezzotin to mixed, uh, mixed techniques as well. And there's Barlow. Emile returned the favour and painted uh, Barlow's portrait there shortly before he died. And as you know, Barlow also made, also sat for um, the ruling passion, Emile's last really great subject painting of the, of the ornithologist. And again, on a great theme of mortality and on ambition and on uh, travel and reminiscence and uh, a, a great painting actually in Glasgow Art Gallery, uh, again showing children, uh, young and old, uh, the contrasts within the painting are wonderful here. Uh, so um, here we have, and, and we have the birds, uh, but there's Barlow, and it's actually just shortly before Barlow's death himself, um, but there, there we are, there they are together, just to, if you can look at that. And uh, a great influence upon uh, some of Millet's portraiture is said to be, uh, uh, Jean-Baptiste Gouers, the French artist, and as you can see there's one, a painting that quite possibly Millet based a ruling passion on, uh, The Charitable Lady by Gouers, and uh, Millet was often doing this in his paintings, he was referencing other great works of art, and uh, this was going on. But some of his child portraits certainly refer reference Gruers, particularly from the Manchester Square Wallace collection. You can see that in a lot of the Gruers portraits and uh, Reynolds paintings from there that they do inform um, Millet's portraiture. I shown this one the other week, but I just this is up the road from me in Oxford, uh, Gladstone in his doctoral robes. Um, absolutely superb piece of painting of an elderly statesman. Millet painted Gladstone uh, four times. We've often talked about Tennyson in our series on Victorian England. No better portrait of Tennyson really than Millet's portrait of 1881. Millet had known Tennyson since the 1850s when Millet worked on the illustrations for the Moxon Tennyson and Tennyson had been a great inspiration to Millet's subject pictures throughout his life, indeed his pre-Raphaelite brothers and later on in his life too. Uh, Sweet Emma Moreland was one of his later paintings, but and Dew Drenched Furs of course. But Tennyson a great mentor to Millet and Millet returns the favour with this with, with uh, quintessential portrait of Tennyson 
similar to the Cameron photograph, but um, uh, Tennyson in his cape. And again, look at the eyes. That's something distinctly brilliant about Millet's portraiture. And there he is, Millet in his studio. Um, seems to keep it much more tidy than almost any other artist I, I know, really. Uh, certainly better than I do. Um, but as you notice on his shelf, he has a lot of little um, photographs by Rupert Potter of his paintings. Some of these are paintings by other artists, <coughs> but many are paintings of his own art to remind him. He's got twins actually up on his shelf there, and uh, he has other of his paintings he's working on. On the easel, I would point out that we've got um, uh, Lord Rosebery, the, the, the later Prime Minister after Gladstone, in, in progress. And um, Rosebery's daughter, Lady Peggy Primrose. And that is a photograph by Rupert Potter, which is exactly the same pose that Peggy Primrose for the little fancy picture that uh, Millet did of her. And uh, there's Millet reading the Times as he did. He would enter the studio at 10 in the morning, read the Times and then set to work. He would sometimes play cards as he looked up at the painting and worked out what he would have to do to it. So it was a sort of process with him. It was a it was a lot a lot of thought went into it but uh, the actual action when he was working on the portrait was quite quick there we are there's another one not, i've just put that in as an example princess maria of edinburgh um there's the photograph by potter and there's the melee painting reynolds the great uh model for melee's later art and child painting penelope boothby and the age of innocence above it and a potter photograph which helped assist in Millet in one of his child pictures. And we can see that how that comes out in his work. Later, male portraiture. Here we have uh, John Hare, the famous Victorian actor. This is in the Garrick Club in London. Uh, I had to take it through glass, so the, the, you don't get quite all the texture. This is Arthur, Sir Arthur Sullivan. And uh, this one's a wonderful little, a wonderful painting in the National Portrait Gallery. Again, very, very rapidly painted, beautifully painted. Um, and a great study of the composer. And uh, just, just look at the uh, way that the pedimenti around, around him, he's, you can see the way he's made the changes. He hasn't erased all the changes, which is a, a thing to watch with me. Like he, doesn't, he doesn't cover all these things up in layers and layers of paint. It's all about the touch. And uh, he, he works rapidly. And that is a, a fine later portrait, Sullivan. Um, not so successful, I think, this one of uh, Gertrude Vanderbilt, but these are showing the circles he's now mixing in. Some of the very, very wealthy families of uh, late Victorian um, England and America. And uh, Gertrude Vanderbilt here at about the age of 12 painted. This one came up on the market. It's a very huge portrait, actually. Rather vulgar furniture, and I'm sure Ruskin would have had a fit seeing this one, thinking the man who had painted autumn leaves could paint something like that. But um, there we are, that's, that's a late melee uh, of Gertrude Vanderbilt um, into that house at the Breakers in, in, uh, in Rhode Island. And uh, the Wertheimer family were of course big patrons, well the cousins of these were the patrons of Sargent, but also great patrons of Millet's art. And this is Miss, Mrs. Charles Wertheimer. Here we can see he's now fully into using almost a pastiche Gainsborough style uh, Master Rankin, you can see that at Leighton House in London. Uh, Little Speedwell's Darling Blue, uh, paint that's at uh, Lady Lever Art Gallery in Port Sunlight. Obviously a play upon um, uh, Age of Innocence by Reynolds, and yet the touch is far more similar to a Thomas Gainsborough than it is to a Reynolds. But a wonderful study, almost like a pendant to bubbles really a female pendant to part of bubbles and this one Dorothy Lawson was just on the market last year and that's a, a fine a fine uh, child portrait um, beautifully painted I say he didn't really make sketches but um, uh, the Royal Academy have a, a folio of uh, some of his um, probably he did these to show people, clients exactly how he would pose them so this is his very last female portrait of the Marchioness of Tweeddale, Tweeddale in 1895-96. Uh, I don't have the colour paint, I don't have the colour photograph of the painting, and I, uh, which is in the family collection, I believe, but that's the message of it. So it just shows you how from conception to 
execution it would have looked. Um, but this wasn't so much as something he followed. He probably would have shown this to the Marchioness or the Marquis of Tweeddale to see if that was what they, they would want, rather than it being a sort of guide. Um, but there we are. That's, that's, a, that's the very, very late Millet portrait. And these are the last two male portraits. Sir Robert Puller of Perth, um, of the um, uh, great uh, textile firm in Perth and dying firm. Um, he, uh, the family were known to the Gray family and Millet knew the Pullers. This is in Perth Art Gallery. But you see, there's no loss of touch, even in his, in, as he was dying at this stage. And he was being attended to by the man on the right, Sir Richard Quain. And it was, in fact, Sir Richard Quain, who was a physician. This painting now stand, uh, hangs in the Royal College of Physicians, who performed uh, the tracheotomy upon Millet in 1896 to help him breathe in the last few months of his life. And Millet died in the August of that year. Um, he had had throat cancer. He had been made president of the Royal Academy in 1896. His um, speech that year was barely audible. Uh, he'd had throat cancer, um, but he kept working to the end. And really, it's the last two months of his life. He was bedridden and dying. But he had had us really because he had begun so young. He still had a 55-year uh, career um, at the top, and uh, he was um, Victorian in England's preeminent painter. Um, so much about Millet uh, that we can learn from the way he depicts people and his fellow countrymen. Um, he, it's a, um, you get an understanding of Victorian England. If you look at Millet's portraits, you'll get an understanding of um, the class system, you get an understanding of the political uh, framework in which, in which he laboured, you get an understanding of the fe feminine beauty of Victorian England, you get an understanding of the, uh, their attitude to children, childhood, uh, you'll get so much from it and we've got to, we've let, let alone his landscapes and his subject pictures, his portraits alone I believe are very well worth considering and think of the trajectory from uh, the early portraits through to this. I mean, some will see it as a decline, but it's an, it's an evolution. And it, it just reflects the changes that he's, he witnessed in his life and the changes within society around him. He may not have been as adventurous as someone like Edward Manet or Edgar Degas in, in France, but the circumstances in England were very different. And Millet uh, certainly he knew his responsibility as an academician. So here we are at the end of, uh, of, of this presentation on his portraits. Uh, this is a, a self-portrait which is up in Aberdeen on the right, uh, which I recommend that collection. There has a lovely portrait of Georges de Maurier as well at the uh, collection in Aberdeen, which is well worth seeing. And that's um, another self-portrait. And the other self-portrait on the left is in a Vasari corridor uh, the Uffizi in Florence, um, along the, the likes of all the great artists of Europe from the Renaissance. Um, so Millet is in good, very good company there. Unfortunately, the Vasari Corridor is most often off limits. So um, uh, you you had to, if you went to the exhibition in 2007, 2008, you were fortunate enough to see that self-portrait on the left. If not, you'll have to uh, beg and plead with people to get into the Vasari Corridor in Florence. <laughs>